Hello, my name is Mary Knack, and I'm the Executive Director of ACEDS, the Association of Certified eDiscovery Specialists, and I want to welcome you to a very warm summer school webinar series on our ACEDS webinar channel. We have with us a, our fabulous affiliate uh, BIA, and they're bringing a, an educational program for us uh, today. And as always, your questions are very, very important. The Q&A tab is down at the bottom. We've already received a bunch from folks that put their questions in at the registration time. Uh, so just add your add your questions there. The uh, slides will be avail are available for download in your console. And what we're going to be covering today is an eclectic group of hot topics uh, in e-discovery. We, de we depend on our great affiliates to help us with our educational mission and BIA, uh, besides creating wonderful blog content, also um, is one of our uh, premier partners to bring us uh, webinar education. They've just started a podcast and our friend Mark McDonald SEDS, our SEDS friend Mark McDonald, is going to be the moderator for this uh, particular uh, webinar, and he is, he oversees BIA's business development, uh, he's got over 10 years of uh, hard-won experience in our wonderful e-discovery uh, industry, and he's he's been in all sorts of different areas of e-discovery, from data analysis to managed attorney re review, both from the law firm and the corporate uh, side, and he is... Uh, obviously, a SEDS and one of my favorite SEDS. So, Mark McDonald, will you um, please take the reins and introduce our presenters? Thank you very much, Mary. We certainly appreciate you, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, we've got a lot to cover today, so I'm going to do a couple quick intros. We'll jump right in. Um, for those questions we don't get to today, um, as always, we will uh, answer them and then put them on the BIA blog, which we'll send everybody afterwards. So today we've got Brian Schrader, president and founder of BIA Industry Trend Center for over 20 years. Um, really the most important thing you need to know about Brian is that when he was 11 years old, he used his paper route money to buy his first computer, a Commodore 128. Um, from there, the rest is history. Barry Schwartz, senior AD, ADV uh, and in charge of our ADV group, uh, 10 years at BIA, resident expert in all things managed review services, GDPR, advanced AI, and analytics. And guys, I'm going to take it from there. I'll, I'll leave it there and let you take it from there. How's that? Sounds good, Mark. Uh, this is Brian. Uh, so first, thank you everybody for attending today. And uh, you know, as we go through, um, as Mary said, we have a, quite a number of topics today. We're going to try to hit them all. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, we'll, we'll try to hit as many of those at the end. And feel free to um, submit those as we go along. So. Um, Today we're going to cover four pretty different topics, um, but they're all kind of obviously connected together. Uh, the first is talking more about the ever-expanding data universe. Um, you know, when we first got into this industry, there was um, the biggest challenge was finding thumb drives and, and USB drives and DVDs and CDs that people would store data on and stick in their desk drawers, um, and that's obviously changed quite a bit. We're going to talk a lot about social media uh, specifically because that's become quite the hot topic as, as far as that go, uh, as far as data collection goes. Uh, we're going to talk about cross-border e-discovery challenges and, and the GDPR in particular. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about preparation for e-discovery, uh, which is um, you know a topic that's been around for a while, but we find that, uh, that it's a great topic of, of interest for people to kind of better understand how to prepare because the preparation uh, makes all the difference in the world, both in terms of cost, efficiencies, and, and, eff and effectiveness of each discovery. And then last but not least, we're going to hit uh, some trends in technology-assisted review. Um, actually, yesterday, uh, uh, there was a, uh, well, recently, I don't know if it was yesterday, I saw an article yesterday about a recent uh, survey done by um, Ari Kaplan, who, uh, in, the, in the survey, uh, people that he had, or the people he had surveyed, 88% uh, of corporations said they're now using TAR to some degree, and 100% of the law firms he spoke to are now using TAR in some degree. So finally, it's gone from everybody talking about it to now it seems like everybody doing it. Uh, and so we want to talk a little bit about the practical applications and, and some of the things you might not think about uh, using TAR for. So let's dive right in. 
Um, we do have an ethics component to this. Uh, throughout the uh, presentation, you'll see that ethics logo at the top in, in little miniature form next to some uh, topics and, and items that we talk about and case law that we talk about. Uh, because you know, the ABA model rules talk about uh, the importance that a lawyer should keep abreast of changes in the law practice, including the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. And more and more bar associations are talking about how important it is that lawyers keep on top of technology and understand it, or at least uh, know what they don't understand to bring in those that do, uh, because it's being seen as as really a, a base requirement of, of competently uh, representing your your uh, uh, your clients. And so more and more courts are kind of latching onto that. So we, we talk about it throughout this presentation. Um, so let's jump into the first topic, the ever-expanding data universe. And so, as I said before, you know, when we first started, it was just computers and, and servers and laptops and backup tapes, pretty standard stuff. Now it's chat and instant messaging and, and text messaging and social media and cloud apps, the Internet of Things, and a whole lot more. There are more places to store data than you could ever even imagine uh, the possibilities. But uh, let's talk about some of the main ones. And the first one we're going to talk about really is just one of the older ones, um, kind of uh, with a new twist on it. Uh, you know, text messaging and instant messages have been around for a long time. Uh, they never have been quite as central to cases as they are today. More and more cases we're seeing uh, talk about pulling chat uh, from systems like Slack and uh, Microsoft Teams, which we use here internally, um, and other sources like that. Uh, we're working now and specifically with a client came to us yesterday with a chat system that apparently has no real ability natively to pull out inf information. Um, and so, you know, two things to kind of keep in mind. Number one, you, you know, if you're going through litigation today and you're not asking questions about chat systems, be that, you know, like I said, Teams or Slack, the kind of corporate chat systems or Yammer or Microsoft um, or uh, Snapchat or, or um, uh, the various instant messaging uh, services that, that, that tend to disappear over time. Uh, it's something that is more important now than ever because, you know, in the past, most of those chat programs were used more for personal. People tended to spend more time on instant messaging and, and, and chat systems um, discussing personal items, not so much business. Today, it's almost every business has some sort of chat system installed, uh, and it can become where, you know, the most important conversations happen. Uh, so it's definitely something to think about and uh, something you want to make sure that you're asking about in every single one of your cases. Um, so, uh, but beyond that, the most significant place that we've seen in, in kind of um, the data collections in, in non-traditional places is social media. Not that social media is not traditional, but it, that it's becoming so much more involved in cases today. Everything from employment and labor disputes uh, to to harassment cases, of course, those kind of things uh, come up on social media. Personal injury cases, we'll talk about some of those uh, here in a minute. Uh, but social media, because it's becoming you know, even more central to our, our lives, every business now has some sort of social media presence, really. Um, it is becoming important um, for, for every case to at least, again, consider it. Uh, you know, it, it may seem like uh, the um, it, it may seem like a case in, involving contract disputes or something might not involve social media. But we have to remember social media is, at the end of the day, a communications uh, solution. And so just like you're looking at email, you should be looking at chats, you should be looking at social media as well. And, of course, we'll talk a little bit about how social media can win cases hands down, um, in, in, in personal injury especially, in medical uh, uh, malpractice cases and things of that nature. So 52% of lawyers in, report an increase in lawsuits related to social media in the past two years. Um, and that was a couple of years ago, I think, that that is from, or a year or so ago. Uh, so it's increasing even more. Um, we talked about disputing medical malpractice or insurance claims, personal injury claims. That's a big place for it. 
Um, and it's not, you know, at one point people kind of looked at social media and says, well, this is private. Courts have made it clear that access to social media uh, will be compelled, especially public stuff and even private. Like if you're, you know, sharing messages on on, on social media platforms with friends and those are walled off from the public, they're still fully discoverable, just like your email, uh, your private email would be. It's really no different. Of course, you're looking at it as just another communication solution. Um, and it's being used in criminal cases. This uh, Foster case, um, this the, the uh, uh, convicted felon was out on parole and uh, he, he had posted uh, drug paraphernalia and, and guns and, and photos onto his uh, onto his Facebook page, I believe, and ended up violating his probation and resulted in, in going back to prison for at least another year. So you know, even in even in criminal cases, it's becoming an important thing. Um, and you know, as we note here, it's not just about so uh, just about messages. You can get geolocations. You can know where people were uh, it, it, on certain platforms and when they posted. You can identify other potential witnesses in a case. When you look at a witness's social media, you can see who they're interacting with, whether it's through pictures or content or or conversations. Um, you can see whether the jury is tweeting during your trial uh, using geo fencing, where we look at, for example, if some if we would have Put a geofence around the Eastern District Courthouse. We could have told uh, the attorneys in the Al Chapo case that the jurors were tweeting, um, and uh, you know, unfortunately, nobody came to us and asked us to do that. So, uh, plus, you can also find out all sorts of affiliations, of course, especially on things like LinkedIn and professional platforms. So, social media—it's not just about kind of that oh, posting you know cat videos or, or funny pictures or things. There is all sorts of content on there, and just like email was. 10 years ago, people don't think about what they're putting in social media. They're not as careful and they're likely to reveal, lo and behold, the truth in a lot of circumstances. So it's very, very important. Um, the interesting thing is about how much, um, uh, how big social media is a part of the daily business. Now, obviously, email is not social media, but it's put here for comparison purposes. 99.1% of, of, uh, uh, of workers utilize email. It may be surprising to you that 62.8% use external social networking for business. So external social networking, a lot of times it's LinkedIn for business, but it's also more and more uh, Twitter and Facebook, uh, Instagram and other things as well. Um, instant messaging is used by 58.4% of people now for business. These again, these are things that people used to be thought of as, as um, uh, social technologies as more personal life things are now being used in the workplace. External social networks for personal use, those are, uh, again, more like social, uh, more like uh, Facebook and Instagram, uh, and internal social media platforms are now being used as well. There are companies that are creating platforms that um, that are like Facebook for the internal. I think Facebook has an offering to Barry. What's the name of that platform? I can't remember off the top of my head. I know you were just dealing with it. Called Workplace. Maybe Workplace. Yes, thank you. Workplace. I know it was Work something. I know it was Workforce. It's Workplace, which is which is a kind of Facebook for just the office. Um, and, and so there are all sorts of, of places like that. And again, the reason we highlight these is because people don't think about um, these solutions as being really business solutions, but they are more and more business solutions today. So uh, let's talk about some real life examples. How can this, and the, and the best ones we have are, are, are personal injury cases we've been involved in because that's where social media is really, really used. We do thousands of these requests a year. Um, and uh, one of them is this, uh, what we call the lying lifeguard, um, claimed a, a, an injury, Achilles, in, Achilles tendon injury, couldn't work. And lo and behold, um, on her uh, uh, blog that we had found and social media sites, photos with her climbing uh, waterfalls in Bali in Australia. Not exactly something you could do with Achilles in, tendon injury. And so clearly she wasn't anywhere near as impaired as, as the as she may have wanted the, the court to, to believe, and that pretty much ended that case. Another one, a bogus brain birth injury. There was a, a claim of medical malpractice with, with a child at birth, and the parents were claiming that the child had been, uh, never been really mobile or athletic and was able to un, un, unable to enjoy the same activities as other children. Lo and behold, their social media posts, however, uh, talked about how the child had grown up attending football and soccer camps and was able to run a hundred yard dash as fast as the eighth graders when, when, uh, as when the child was in like sixth grade or something like that. And so again, that pretty much ended the case because it went directly against 
um, uh, all of their claims. And so these are just some of the examples of uh, social media uh, being used, like I said, in personal injury cases. But um, recently we did a case, and I can't remember, I can't really go through the details of it, but uh, for you know thousand dollars worth of social media uh, investigation, um, the uh, insurance company was able to very quickly, within the first couple of months, get summary judgment on a five hundred thousand dollar claim. And so, you know, that, the thing that I, social media, unlike other things in the e-discovery, social media is really cheap. Um, you know, it's usually, you know, like I said, maybe a thousand, a couple of thousand, depending on how many websites and things you got to look at, but it's really cheap and it could win the whole case for you. And so if you're not looking at this today, you really should, because when you talk about ROI, you know, there's not much in e-discovery that gives you quite the same return on investment that a social media investigation can do. And you should really do it early on. Um, and one of the things we've been telling uh, our, our clients as well is that they should be doing it on their own clients because, you know, we had a client recently or a law firm we were working with and lo and behold found out that you know that the, their client was lying to them um about a person about an injury and the, their you know facebook posts uh showed that, that they were out having fun and dancing when they were supposedly, supposedly injured and not able to move so you know it's just as important uh, we have we, we're starting to see some plaintiff firms use it on their intake process um and and running these social media because again especially in in you know these are these are uh, contingency cases, the law firm is pay paying the cost up front. It's better to find out early on uh, if there's something that's going to, in your client's social media post, that's going to either cause a problem or, or completely prevent the case from the very beginning. So look at some no notable social media cases here. Um, I'm not going to go through every single one of them because they're pretty straightforward and, and all the, all the uh, citations are there and, and you'll be able to get this slide presentation after the, afterwards as well. So you have to worry about writing all this stuff down. Um, but you know, you can look at some of this stuff. Uh, you know, this uh, the first one is uh, had to do with trademark infringement. It's not even you know no personal injury, no nothing. It was all about trademark infringement. And Twitter and LinkedIn posts were used to establish uh, the claims in that case. Um, conviction in a second degree assault based on Facebook image, uh, Facebook evidence. Um, Facebook shows uh, that an employee termination was legitimate. Um, so it's employment labor law. Okay. Social media considered as a factor in establishing minimum contacts for, for jurisdictional considerations. Who'd have thought when we're talking about jurisdiction and, and you know, long arm statutes and things of that nature that, that social media might come into play. Uh, and the last one, you know, is a, is a case that um, uh, where the judge stated it's, it's not black letter law, but it's it's a pretty strong statement that it's now should be a matter of professional competence for an attorney to take the time to investigate social networking sites. Because, you know, as the cases above that uh, point out, it's just another source for evidence. It's not limited to personal injury. It's not limited to any of that kind of stuff. It can, it can be the smoking gun in a case that we used to all look at email to be. Uh, so definitely something you should, you should think about. Um, and, uh, you know, that brings on the case of the question of, okay, well, if social media is so important, there've got to be preservation obligations, of course, uh, just like any other evidence, you got to worry about preserving the data. Uh, the, and, and, you know, these are some of the cases, Barry, I know that you've, you know, lo looked at a lot of these cases in, in a lot of depth and, and why don't you kind of run through them really quick? Uh, sure. Thank you, Brian. Um, the Gatto case is interesting in that the the plaintiff here had a personal had a workplace injury suit against United Airlines, and had deleted uh, his Facebook post when he noticed that there was an IP address accessing his his uh, Facebook that wasn't expected. So he deleted his account, and the person looking at his account was United's attorney, and. Uh, the United filed a motion for spoliation and won. And the, one of the, the takeaway issues here is knowing what the terms of service are for the various uh, social media um, platforms that are being used. And in Facebook's case, they have a very short term um, period upon which after an account is closed that the, they maintain the data. And it's, it's weeks or months or a month, not uh, forever. And when United noticed that the Facebook uh, post was gone, um, they asked Gatto to restore it, and it was not possible to be restored. In the 
in, in, in the um, Regal Entertainment case, the consul had advised um, had not advised their their plaintiff uh, to preserve their Facebook account, and as a result, Regal won a a sanction for that. However, they did lose the case, and they won four thousand dollars in in uh, costs for their uh, discovery efforts. However, they did lose by a couple million dollars in the the final analysis. And in the next case down, the Catterall case is interesting. It's a trademark case and a trademark infringement case. And the plaintiff was the established restaurant and a competitor opened up, used their same straight trade style, same color of font, the same color of logo, same font style, same menu style and so forth. And the defendant had deleted their their posts and the uh, plaintiff was able to have those f posts reestablished because the account for the defendant was still active on Facebook. And um, so, you know, that, that's an important lesson because that evidence is there, as Brian was discussing with the, the criminal case, what's there is there and it's, it's meaningful to the opposing party, perhaps. In the, hey, the Hawkins case, yes? Sorry, I want to tap in for one second because uh, in regards to when, when you know somebody has deleted their Facebook account, can you just really quickly give kind of a highlight on what that process might be to encourage or get the court to encourage them to, to or force them to reestablish it? Well, th that's a twofold question mark. And the reason being is you may not know that it was deleted um, until after the fact that Facebook had now no longer maintained those records. Um, so that, that's one aspect. The other aspect is if you see um, a Facebook um, post that is important for your side of the case and it, it hasn't been uh, defensively and uh, preserved, you can take a snapshot of the site and use that as um, an indicator that there was data up, there was information up, that should have been preserved and hopefully um, retaining somebody such as us to do a social media uh, defensible collection can be done in time. So there's, there's twofold. Yeah. One, if the account is deleted versus two, whether the data was taken down. So there, there's two aspects to that. And so, and Barry in the Cotty Roll company, the Cotty Roll case, for example, or hopefully I'm saying that right. Um, uh, in that case, if I remember correctly, the court uh, you know, the the, the uh, plaintiff had seen that the defendant's Facebook page had all of this information, and then noticed that it was gone one day. Uh, and the court said, "Well, I, th I believe the court made them put the post back up, uh, as well as That's exactly you know, did correct. say to the plaintiff, you know, well, you you knew this was there. There's a limited amount. You know, there were still sanctions and things issued, but it was one of these things about okay, well." You, know, you knew it was there. You saw it was there. You had taken. They had taken some some preservation uh, steps. The plaintiffs themselves did around the defendant's Facebook page. They had uh, some printouts and and or some forensically sound copies, I believe, of the of the information. But it was interesting that you know Barry's right. You don't always know what was there and what was deleted. Um, but in this case, makes perfect example of the fact that 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 uh, you can get yourself into hot water if you're not telling your count or your your client that. You need to preserve this stuff just like you would tell them they need to preserve their email or anything else. And if they don't, um, well, I guess why don't we skip down to the last one because that's the that's the one that that I think uh, yeah, that, is is really amazing, where the council was saying the poster child. Their client, yeah, it's the poster child. Five hundred plus thousand dollar sanction. I'd call that quite the quite the disincentive uh, for what happened. Why don't you go ahead and, and well, review in, that in, in that case that. Certainly. In, in that case, the um, consul had advised their client to clean up their Facebook posts and, and their profile and delete pictures and deactivate the account. And um, as a result, the attorney was sanctioned over half a million dollars. And his client was also sanctioned almost $200,000 for following the attorney's uh, inappropriate advice. Brian? So, you know, clearly... Yeah, so so clearly, you know, preservation obligations 
uh, and social media are a big thing to keep in mind. And they can, just as much as social media can make or break a case, failing to preserve your social media can make, the break, make or break a case, just like any other spoliation could. So a couple of last points about social media, some of the things people ask us about all the time. Um, one of the things you can examine so public profiles in, of uh, social media accounts, keep in mind that, that in a lot of these platforms, uh, people can see who's looking at them. So you might want to just, it's always better to have an investigator, kind of a neutral party, uh, go through and collect the information and you review it later. But you can look at posts that are public. There's nothing inappropriate about that from an ethics perspective. Um, you, again, you should be considering these, uh, so you should be you should be at least thinking about social media in every single case and um, and going to an expert because they can oftentimes help you understand how social media might uh, play into a case uh, where you might not even think it would. You know, again, trademark infringement, who would have thought? Um, things that you don't do. Do not, do not, do not friend or follow parties or jurors or judges. Judges are a little, little more, bit of a gray area, um, but definitely don't follow uh, don't do not try to friend your opposing parties uh, or jurors. Uh, don't simply print out social media profiles. Some courts, again, that's a little bit of a of a crapshoot because some courts will allow you. I mean, at the end of the day, whether evidence is is admissible is up to the. I mean, there are guidelines obviously around it, but it's a judge's decision. And so, some courts will let you print out a social media page, like a Facebook page, to, to PDF and and consider that good enough. Uh, but not every court will. And so, you know, again, this is, I can't stress how, how inexpensive these collections are compared to anything else uh, in, in litigation, really, rediscovery. And so it's worth having somebody who knows uh, what they're doing preserve those pages just to make sure you don't face any problems with, with getting that evidence uh, admitted later on. Um, and finally, this should go without saying, but don't hack social media accounts. If you find out somebody's password, you know, this happens a lot in in kind of family disputes more than anything where somebody's like, oh, I know my, my spouse's password or I know my, you know, whatever friend's password. Uh, obviously don't try to hack in or look into the accounts and look behind private walls or try to use somebody else's credentials. So they may, may tell you, oh, I've got the credentials to that person's Facebook groups so like you can look in, just don't. It's, if it feels wrong, it's wrong. <laughs> it's definitely gonna be wrong here. Uh, just just uh, uh, don't try to sneak around and, and poke into somebody's Facebook or, or uh, other private accounts. Um, either you can compel that private stuff through subpoenas, uh, or you can get a professional to come in and help you manage that process as well. Um, so some of the other kind of data areas that we'll talk about pretty quick, because these are topics that we've covered in the past um, uh, that are becoming more common today. The cloud, sure, you know, uh, the cloud in 2010, 11 was was a new thing. Today, whether you not whether you know it or not, almost everybody's got something in the cloud somewhere. Uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook and a lot of those things. Well, Facebook maybe not so much, but they they run their own. But you know, even Netflix runs in Amazon, I believe. So uh, the cloud is is it's just a marketing term. It's a better uh, data center experience essentially. Um, you might hear people talk about a private cloud. That just means that instead of shared resources and when we talk about resources we're talking about storage and computers and servers and databases and whatever what have you clouds really kind of take all that stuff mash it into one big piece and then let everybody use the individual resources that they need to a private cloud just gen generally refers it's more like a somebody's data center it's it's really is it's a really nice marketing term but a private cloud is just really a data center run on virtual machines probably um so, you know, in, in essence, the, the funny thing about cloud computing is it's really a return to the client server model. It's, it's this idea of everything running on a central machine somewhere uh, and, and more and more of our computers becoming more like dumb terminals of past. Uh, but uh, it, it's not something that should scare you or concern you at all. It's really just, you know, kind of talks about architecture of the, of the computer systems and, and has very little to do with whether or not you can collect data um, it, your 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 obligations still stay the same. What are some of the examples? Well, of course, Salesforce.com is probably the biggest example in in the business world of of a cloud. It was I don't know if it was the first. They like to say they're the first. Uh, they were they were really truly the first kind of cloud internet business. Really, that uh, they were the cloud before they was before it was called the cloud. Um, uh, Oracle and NetSuite's there. QuickBooks, Sage Dynamics. 
Gmail, of course, Office 365, MacMail, Hotmail, all of these things, Office 365 and Google Docs, Evernote, AWS, all sorts of different things are in the cloud these days. And again, you know, this isn't something that should like scare anybody or concern, oh, what's in the cloud, what are we going to do? And again, it's just it's just really about the machine architecture. The computers are the computers are the computers. The data is the data is the data. It's still there. It's still available. You just got to know where to look. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how to find it here in a second. So, you know, cases that implement cloud computing, pretty much everything. So intellectual property, commercial disputes, employment labor, profession, or product liability, criminal. You know, how would product liability, how would that possibly involve the cloud? Well, you know, a lot of companies are building their database systems, such as, uh, you know, tracking the, the um, uh, product liability claims. Um, in things like the, the database system that, uh, that Salesforce uses called, uh, I think it's called force.com, that you could build entire solutions on all, all customized and you could use it to track, you know, uh, uh, product manufacturing, you could in product complaints, whatever have you. Uh, there's really, you know, pretty much anything um, that involves electronic information today could implicate the cloud. Uh, and so the thing to remember about that is at the end of the day, it doesn't change your base obligations, just because something's stored in Salesforce, for example, doesn't mean that your responsibility is to maintain that information, to preserve that information, to put a legal hold on that information, to collect and review that information and produce it is no different because it's in the cloud as if the, it was on a server in your client's data center. And the best case for that um, is this Brown versus Tellerman case. And it's a couple of years old now, but it's still probably one of the best cases I've seen that deal with this issue. And because it has so many different parts to it. And essentially what happened here in this case was a salesperson uh, uh, had been fired for you know, non-performance and was saying, well, you know, they had uh, met all their performance criteria and met their sales quota and their, 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 uh, they wanted to use the Salesforce uh, information to prove that the um, that the, sale, the salesperson wanted to pull the information from the company Salesforce to prove that you know phone calls were made and, and quotas were made and, and activity was there and sales were there and everything because everything they do for anybody who uses Salesforce or really any CRM to its fullest extent you can use it to check and see you know all the different communications how are your salespeople actually performing are they sitting in their office twiddling their thumbs waiting for the phone to ring or are they making calls every day uh, like good salespeople should right Mark. Uh, and so in this case, which was all about whether or not the salesperson performed, um, they wanted to use the Salesforce data. And the attorney went into court and said, Your Honor, we have no control. We don't own Salesforce. The information is in Salesforce's computers. We can't do anything about it. And there were also claims because instead of preserving that information, they just assigned that old salesperson's account to a new person who then began overwriting all sorts of stuff through his normal activities. Um, obviously, the sales, the new salesperson wasn't intentionally doing it. It's just because they just reassigned the exact same account to a new person. It started dirtying up the waters. Um, well, come to find out, Salesforce's own contract, and you'll find this in most enterprise level cases, uh, in the most enterprise level, meaning business uh, solutions like Salesforce that are really sold to corporations and enterprises, are going to have a clause in it, almost every one of them, that says, your data is yours. It is owned by you, the customer, not by Salesforce, the company. And so um, faced with that, the court wasn't too happy, uh, you know, because not only had counsel misrepresented it, it wasn't necessarily intentional, but counsel didn't know the, the truth. It didn't know the reality, it didn't really investigate it, didn't know what they were talking about. And instead of going out and learning about it or finding someone who knew about it, they just made assumptions uh, based on, you know, uh, what they thought to be the case ended up not to be the court ended up sanctioning the defendant and counsel issued an adverse inference that precluded the, the defendant from using their strongest defense strategy at the, at the case because um, uh, because all this evidence had not only been uh, kind of destroyed or dirtied up and muddied because of the preservation wasn't done correctly but also because of the misrepresentations in court that the company had no ability to do anything when in truth it was all uh, they had full power over their data and they could get it at any time they wanted to. Um, last thing that we'll talk about really quick is the Internet of Things. Uh, this is probably the kind of most cutting edge thing as far as data collection goes these days, depending on what you're talking about. Um, 
I don't need to go through all the statistics. You can just see 42 billion connected devices by 2022. I don't know, what is that? Six devices per person in the world or something? I mean, it's, it's a huge amount of things. What is Internet of Things? It's everything from the smartwatch on your wrist to the smart toaster in your kitchen. Um, it's anything that can store information and is collected to, is connected into the cloud or the overall internet, um, and more and more devices from smart scales to to pretty much everything uh, has all this information. And uh, here's some examples: car dash cameras, thermostats, manufacturing monitors, wearable trackers, home uh, assistants like Amazon Echo and Google, security devices, devices and devices for seniors. And why do we even bring this up? Um, you know, why are these important? Because these devices, and I actually I just wrote an article about this, um, you know, called Alexa can I be used against? Can you be used against me in court? Uh, because we're starting to see cases where um, people are requesting the history from the Alexa devices, and other uh, you have seen some other cases where uh, criminal um, investigations have subpoenaed Amazon for records of suspects. Uh, uh, recordings because who knows what might have been accidentally recorded by that device. Um, maybe during a murder scene, somebody yelled out Alexa for help. And, uh, and any moment now, my Alexa device is going to start talking to us, but uh, probably should mute that. There we go. Um, so, you know, it is, uh, there's all sorts of information. If you're, if you're in a personal injury suit, um, and you're claiming you can't be mobile or whatever, well, great. You guys see you're wearing a smartwatch. Let me see all of the information about your physical activity over the last six months. Um, you know, it's the, the idea of what um, information is available out there uh, from these Internet of Things devices is only limited by your imagination. And so, again, this is a great place to have someone who, who is really familiar with these uh, topics be able to go through and, and, and help you figure out how um, devices like this might factor into your case. And again, it's not just about personal injury. It could be about all sorts of other devices. Um, just showing you the rapid growth of these of these devices over time. Uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, if you look at this kind of growth of devices uh, over, over the next projected uh, through 2025, one interesting thing we saw about this is here's kind of like all the standard devices, right? Computers, laptops, cell phones, things that we're familiar with. And that doesn't really grow that much. It goes from 10.1 uh, probably billion to 12.7, whatever. It's really the Internet of Things devices that goes crazy. Um, and because more and more devices are being connected over time and it's going to it just become a huge source of information, especially as we go forward in the future. Um, an oil field example, uh, you know, there's sensors in, on machinery that sends alerts with data and technicians that troubleshoot and fix places remotely. Well, if things go wrong, some of that information, diagnostics, could, could factor into product liability suits, could factor into negligence suits, could factor into environmental damage suits, all sorts of different places. Uh, wireless sensors that enable chemical companies to monitor location and condition of cars um, used to transport as transport its most hazardous products involved in an accident. You can see that information being pulled in uh, for use there. And it's just kind of um, uh, GE sensors and, and jet engines. I think I heard something along the lines of, of um, uh, a terabyte of information is, is created with each new Boeing aircraft flight. So it's a huge, just a huge amount of information. And we already kind of talked about identifying and handling these resources. It, again, it's best to find somebody who has had experience in this because if you haven't had the experience, it's hard to think about how some of this might play into the case in front of you today. So, um, you know, the, because the biggest question first is what are, they? you know, what are we talking about in a case? What is even the potential world of, of these devices that might be out there? Once you do that, then you got to figure out where the data is. The data, you know, on my, on my Fitbit might only go back a couple of days on my, device on my watch, but, you know, could go back years in a cloud database somewhere. Uh, who controls that data? Again, is it a corporate device? Is it a personal device? Even with most personal devices, the person still generally controls the data. The, the, um, it, usually there are some differences between that, but at the end of the day, most places, it's still your data, or at least you have access to that. 
And again, how to format it, what's it in, how to collect it, review it. Different things have different solutions. Um, and uh, and we're faced with this all the time where people come to us and say, here's some you know product we've never heard of. wasn't really designed for your discovery. How do you get through that? And how do you identify and, and use that information? It's always a challenge. Um, we talked a little bit about this already, what, what type, type of devices. Uh, and the last thing we'll talk about is, now that you know all these issues, how do you go about identifying this? How do you, you know, we've talked about all these different things, from internet devices to, to, to all these cloud devices, to, to Facebook, to Twitter, to everything else. How do you figure out what's there in the first place? Well, involve the custodians. Imagine that. Just talk to the people who, who are involved. You actually have to go out and have those old-fashioned custodian interviews. And one of the best things that, uh, it's the best identification method available. I mean, these guys that were involved in the, in the cases know, um, you know, where all the information, what is out there, what could be out there, where, uh, where that state, uh, where that, all that information lies. And then years past where we could rely on the IT personnel today, you know, it's more about going to the custodians because a lot of times IT doesn't even know in an organization about all the different things that companies are using. So last thing is, um, Custodian, and, and so the last thing I'll say is how to find out a lot about this. You can do the custodian interviews, but the best thing to do is custodian questionnaires. Uh, we use a product called Total Discovery, full disclosure. We created Total Discovery, although we sold it off several years ago. Um, but that's what we use uh, for custodian questionnaires. Um, there are other tools out there. Legal Whole Pro has a tool. Xtero has tools. I would recommend, at the end of the day, custodian questionnaires, electronic custodian questionnaires, are just surveys. They're just a list of questions. Um, and you can ask questions not only about where people keep their data, what systems they use, they use in social media, whatever. You can also ask them, you know, were you involved in the development of this product? Were you at this board meeting? What, you know, what was said on this day? You can ask them factual questions as well because these are all covered by attorney-client privilege. I would recommend do not use free engines like SurveyMonkey and some of those out on the internet because the data, the reason they're free is because they use your data. Um, you want to go and look for a system that doesn't use your data, that you got to pay for, that comes with security. It's Qualtrics is a platform for that. Again, Legal Hope Pro and Total Discovery are two probably of the more more common platforms just because they're completely web-based and no, no software involved. Xero, like I said, is one. There are a couple others out there as well. Uh, but it's quick. You can run this. You can get the information. You can collect it all in one place. And you can figure out which custodians really are central to the case, uh, where most of the data resides. It is It is probably one of the best tools. And again, really, really cheap uh, part, of, part of the discovery process. Highly, highly, highly recommend using custodian questionnaires. So that all being said, um, let's talk about cross-border e-discovery challenges. And for that, I will hand you over to our international data expert, Barry Schwartz. Well, I don't know if I'd go that far, Brian, but thank you. Um, with cross-border e-discovery, there are Several, several concerns or challenges that we need to face. One of them is the technological considerations. Uh, internet is pretty well um, available almost worldwide. So uh, collecting, getting the data, reviewing the data isn't so much an issue anymore, but you have to be concerned with language and regional rules, applications, and uh, attorney practice uh, policies and so forth. Um, I was just talking with a client this morning in Europe, and they had a, a discovery question on how to do document review with hundreds and hundreds of issues that needed to be coded for because that's what the requests contained. Um, there's also the, the issues of being able to understand documents in local idioms, phrases, customs, and, and so forth because what makes sense in American English may not make sense in British English or in French or in German and, and things like that are of concern to attorneys in the US when dealing with foreign language and foreign location custodians. And then the big issue with cross-border e-discovery challenges today is data privacy and security. Um, how do you do international collections? Well, we, we have a, a solution for that, um, which is remote collections, or the collections can be done locally and, and sent to the cloud. Uh, there are issues with where the data can reside. In some instances, we have cases in the Far East, in Europe, where clients want to keep the data local. So then we need to have solutions with respect to that. 
And then the big elephant in the room still is GDPR. And let me talk about a couple of issues with respect to GDPR, which is the European law which governs privacy and use of data for European EU residents. And regulation in the EU equals law in the US. In the GDPR, um, the overriding concern is that privacy in the EU is a fundamental right. And that thereby requires the custodian to be informed of the reasons why their data is being collected. Uh, you need to be specific in what is being collected. Uh, we can't just collect um, all email from a custodian. Typically, the custodian needs to participate in what is being collected. We have to uh, explain why it is being collected and how it's going to be used. And one of the key considerations is obtaining the clear consent of that custodian, noting that the custodian's consent can be withdrawn at any time. And that has implications in the US, and I don't think that there's an answer to this. When a custodian withdraws consent and that custodian's documents have been used in, in pleadings and so forth, um, uh, that's, that's too late in our opinion, but I don't believe that that particular issue has yet been tested in the courts. And there, there is an exception to the custodian's consent, and that is a legitimate interest to do the collection. And again, that has not yet been tested in the courts. And, and then there's also the, Much the financial like, repercussions. I'll just say, hey Barry, I'll just ju just uh, chime in there on the legitimate interest. You know, quite the government thing to do, right? Put out a, a very gray term, and so you know, that's a it's the legitimate interest may be an exception to a lot of this, but a lot of the commentaries will say that there's nothing um, that is is certain that the. European courts would look at American discovery, which is much broader than most European, uh, almost pretty much every European solution, would be seen as a legitimate interest. You know, it is a significant question. To us reading that, if you read the statute, it'd be like, oh, of course it's a legitimate exception. But it's, you got to remember, this is all looked at through the views of a European lens, not an American litigation lens. And so that's why people are very reluctant. There's no real understanding of what legitimate interest could be. It's a completely undefined term. And that's that's correct. And it, to our knowledge, it hasn't been tested yet in the courts. And um, then with financial repercussions, we've all read about the, the $50 billion fine, I believe it was, against Google, and uh, lesser fines against other companies like Marriott and so forth. And that is a uh, critical um, concern because the penalty is a, a percentage of your your net worth, not just a um, a, a calculable normal fine. So um, beware when you're dealing with European uh, data. And last I think point, it might be or the second revenue, point, Barry. Here, not yeah, well, yes. net worth. Not that revenue, just to make that sure. That revenue, yeah. Well, it, it, it is a big penalty, regardless. Yeah. And <laughs> there are similar laws popping up all over the all over the U.S. California's uh, data privacy law is going to affect on January 1st, and we see now that our clients are distributing service provider addendums, uh, which is which are related to consumer privacy across the country, and a, a catch-all clause is being included in those now that says, well. We have the California law that's going into effect, and we're also saying that our addendum is going to apply to any similar laws that go into effect. So um, corporations are, are getting wise to this particular um, risk, and they're, they're papering their, their risk by sending um, addendum contracts out to their, their various vendors and um, resources. And as Brian was mentioning, uh, the Ari Kaplan uh, report, he also quoted um, that 53% of corporate respondents and 71% of law firms today are concerned that the GDPR is impacting their, their e-discovery efforts. And um, going back to one of my earlier points, in Law 360 today, um, most enforcement is circulating around data custodian consent 
and um, the proper use of that data once it is collected. And we, we advise our clients that when in doubt, um, always retain local counsel who can advise you on your, your privacy obligations in foreign jurisdictions. And this is, this is an interesting, um, we, we inserted um, this meet and confer section into our presentation because it, it's an old topic, but it's become a hot topic today. Rule 26 meet and confers um, go to the whole notion that Brian mentioned at the outset, which is preparation, preparation, preparation. Um, being aware of the various timing requirements, of what subjects are going to be covered, what issues uh, regarding disclosure and collection need to be addressed, issues regarding privilege, um, what local rules come into play, and any other courts, any other court orders that are on the table that are um, impacting you and your opposing counsel need to be discussed up front so that you have a plan in place um, that you've agreed to that um, obviates any risks down the road that you haven't done anything uh, appropriately. And to that end, having an ESA protocol in place early in, in a matter um, is, is critical in our opinion. And as I said, we, we see this over and over again, almost uh, daily, we're, we're talking with clients who do not have a protocol in place, have not clearly uh, discuss what it is they're going to be providing in in terms of production and um, identifying uh, identification of custodians and search terms, privilege considerations, production methods, deduplication, and, and all these other bullet points here uh, that aren't being addressed early in the case. And doing that early in the case allows um, for minimizing of any surprises. Uh, well, we got a production, it's PDFs, and they're not searchable. Oh, my. Uh, was that covered in the protocol? Brian? Yeah, let me just throw in there. And um, so the model protocol, like Barry said, it if you're not doing a model protocol, it's it, we have sample forms. There are sample forms all over the place for this stuff. It covers all these kind of topics. It makes sure everybody's on the same page. And it's going to save clients a lot of money because it's just so much easier to agree to this stuff. It's not so much of an argument anymore. Now, it used to be a lot of arguments about what metadata was going to be produced or were you going to do native Excels or whatever. So much of that is just kind of standard practice, but still having this document, you know, clawbacks, you know, it'll give you, you know, generally these protocols will have a better process around clawbacks than the federal rules provide for it, and they're, and they're fine if you agree to it. Uh, but one of the things that where we see protocols come in really, really handy is corporate clients. We have corporate clients who we deal matter over matter with, and by having a standard protocol that the corporation uses in every case will not only make it so that the, that the whole e-discovery process in individual cases goes smoother with less disputes, but also it becomes a workflow. It becomes the basis for turning this into a business process, meaning that it's done exactly the same way every time. And anybody who's ever studied any kind of Six Sigma or Kanban or any of these workflow and business management things, one of the basic tenets of all of that is to have a clear, concise, easy to use, repeatable process that just works every time. And so you can save yourself tons of money uh, if you're a corporate client, uh, corporate uh, litigant who, who especially is involved in a number of litigations, just by having this process that you follow every single time, it's the same process. Um, so just wanted to throw that in there too. Okay, guys, we've Thanks, got Brian. about six minutes left and one topic to cover still. So, um, this Barry, is quick. Brian, this is a big topic. It's a big topic, but it's relatively it's relatively quick because we're just going to talk about some updates and, and talk. Okay. Right. So with, with, with TAR, uh, which is a broad topic in and of itself, uh, word, word of wisdom, virtually every case that BIA touches today, we use technology uh, in some fashion, advanced artificial intelligence. And the way, the various aspects of AI and TAR that we utilize and can be utilized in virtually every case is email threading so that only the most inclusive email and its attachments are reviewed. 
near deduplication, which allows for uh, grouping of documents that have similar content that then allows reviewers to get through those documents much more quickly. Um, it can be used for relevancy review. Uh, is it relevant? Is it not relevant? Um, other areas that are really, really important with respect to technology system review is looking at your opposing party productions. Um, what documents did they include that you didn't have? Or what did they not include that they should have included? Uh, as well as with third party reviews, the same with privilege reviews. Um, being able to group your privilege documents together so that your privilege calls are consistent across documents so that redactions are consistent and correct across documents as well. And it can also be utilized to um, look at specific issues, hot issues as an example, or a production issue. You can be as specific as you want and as narrow as you want because you can have subsets of documents to review. With relevancy review, it also allows for um, looking at the most, the documents that are most likely to be responsive to whichever issue you're looking at first. And uh, as I said, we're using it in most cases and attorneys today, as Brian said at the outset, 88% of corporate respondents and virtually 100% of law firm partners have used um, predictive coding in their their practices and in their businesses. And, yeah, and when I'll it used say, to be, I'll just say really, Bear, I'll just say really quick. There is, is you know, one of the things to, to just we wanted to make clear on technology assisted review and AI in in, in uh, specifically is. It's not just for predictive coding anymore. It's not just for, hey, we've got you know a million documents. Let's review fifty thousand or a hundred thousand, and then use that artificial intelligence to make the decisions on whether or not the other nine hundred thousand documents are responsive or not. That's kind of the traditional use of it. And by the way, for anybody who thinks that's new, the basis of that technology was introduced two hundred years ago, uh, and it's been the same technology that Amazon and Netflix and, Netflix and Pandora have been using to predict what your next favorite movie is going to be or, or show or, or whatever. Uh, but more important than, than that's kind of what TAR has been traditionally used for is what Barry's saying. It's, it's all this other stuff. You know, it makes deduplication that much better. It makes email threading that much better. It makes conceptual clustering that much better. It allows you to do all sorts of really cool stuff that you could never do before. It allows you to do all sorts of efficiencies, making sure you know, you've got similar calls and similar redactions. It's all about using this technology for much more than just technology assisted review, or what's traditionally been called predictive coding. And I think that's probably, you know, the most recent experience. But there's there's one recent one we did here, Barry. You might want to just cover real quick. So I think you were involved in this case. Sure. Um, it was a client who had, as you can see here, 115, 116,000 documents. One attorney was able to plow through. Um, and identify with a, a high rate of precision in recall, only having to review just over 4,000 documents. And as a result, and this is the more traditional TAR application, reviewing a few documents to get to the end result, that client saved uh, $127,000 versus a straight linear contract review that would have been done in the old days, which the old days might have been two, three, four years ago. And to that, and so, <laughs> and so that that brings us to that. We were hoping to save five or ten minutes. We've got a couple of minutes. We'll be happy to stay on for a little bit longer than the than the call is to go through some questions. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, Mark, you've got some questions queued up that everybody's been asking during the slide. So why don't you go ahead and shoot? Dude, thanks. Um, the first one is um, about Microsoft Office 365. Um, is the basic e-discovery service provided through 365 uh, enough? Um, I'll take that one. Uh, the So this is interesting, because right? we use Office 365, and I've had a lot of ex experience with this. We've helped customers deal with Office 365. It's a great platform for your Office 365 materials. Uh, so is the basic good enough? It's hard to answer that question without knowing exactly what your needs are. Um, it's going to be good for some small cases. It's going to be good for uh, some basic e-discovery. Um, if you want to do more advanced stuff, you've got huge amounts of custodians and huge amounts of data. The advanced functions and the advanced capabilities inside of Office 365 Compliance Center are going to be better for you, although there's a higher cost to that. So really, when it comes to answering that question, uh, 
um, it's good to have to, to get specifics. You know, uh, consult with someone who who knows this these solutions and can understand your business better, uh, and then help you figure out whether or not that basic tool is going to solve those needs. It's not a. It's definitely not a one size fits all solution. That being said, Brian, Office 365 compliance centers. Go ahead. Let me add one Fair. point with O365, sure. and and that is the. The searching capability within O365 is somewhat limited, and you're not able to do the complex searching that you might be able to do in a more advanced platform. Yes, and and the other important thing to keep in mind is that um, two things. First off, obviously, anything outside of Office 365, any webmail and social media platforms, and and data you have placed on servers in most cases aren't going to be reached. Office 365. Uh, e-discovering compliance center is going to deal with the information you have in Office 365. What does that mean? Well, it's it's Office 365 email, it's Teams, it's OneDrive, it's solutions like that. It doesn't um, always mean now you can have it set up. You can have Office 365 set up to track data on local computers in certain solutions, but not always. So it's important to remember that Office 365 is a great place to start, but in in, it is never going to be a complete solution to your e-discovery needs in the case. It's going to solve your Office 365 needs and, and collections, but there's a lot of other places to worry about as well. Mark, next question. Um, we'll do one more because we're a little over time. Um, what should the single top priority for an organization to consider in 2020 in relation to e-discovery best practices? <laughs> ah, there's so many of them. We just went through so many of them. Um, you know, I would say the single most important thing to worry about is preserving data because, you know, that's where it all starts. If you don't take the right steps, and, and I say that because, as we talked about in the beginning, there's so much data out there in so many different places that if you don't start a case by really going in, talking to your custodians, doing custodian questionnaires, Understanding your business, talking to the IT, or understanding your client's business, talking to the IT team, and really understanding what data is out there. If you don't know what's there, you can't protect it. And if you don't protect it, you're either going to lose data that's crucial to, to a defense, or you're going to be facing a spoliation motion and lose your case. I mean, um, you know, there have been cases in the last year or two even where companies have been fined millions of dollars just for preservation lapses. Uh, having nothing to do with whether or not their the underlying claims in the case are important. So I would say it's it's that digging in and figuring out what the universe of data looks like at the very, very beginning of a case, because it, you got to preserve that data pretty quick. And if you don't do it, um, like Barry said, a lot of this stuff is Facebook. You get, you know, something, you delete something and it's gone a couple of days later. So I think that's the most important. We got time for one more question, Mark. How about one more? Um, well, this is again about custodian questionnaires. So, as a follow-up to what you said earlier, um, why is it important to keep custodian questionnaires um, long-term? And could you again maybe restate some of the vendors that supply that? Um, sure. I'll, I'll so, take that one. Um, Thanks, Mark. Oh, go ahead, Barry. Thank you. Um, well, preser preserving the data is it's just like. Even though it can be considered attorney work product, it typically is attorney work product, it, the information that's collected and utilized helps guide your case, and you may want to go back and look at the answers again. And we, we've seen this happen in, in several instances where a custodian questionnaire was, was created, answered, and um, reviewed three, four years ago, and it, it's gone back. Uh, it's a source document for information to guide the attorneys and um, in-house uh, personnel on where data is and who is involved with the case and, and so forth. And that it's, it's a repository of that kind of information. And it also allows you to triangulate questions so that you can see who's, who's answering a specific question in a, a given way. And then in terms of uh, Vendors, there's uh, BIA, there's Xtero, there's Zapproved, um, and uh, a, a couple others that have 
uh, defensible questionnaires where the data is, as Brian said, not like SurveyMonkey where it's up in the cloud and used for other purposes. Uh, it's in, these vendors have it in closed systems, so it's it's valuable in, or in secure that regard. Si secure systems, yeah. Secure yes. So most of like we call pro tools discovery and even Xero's are cloud based solutions, but they're they're private. They're they're the data is your data. They are not going to use it for anything else. Um, and, and it's really a completely different approach to it, where these kind of free survey engines are using your data to power other things as well and analyzing it. So you don't want to do that just from attorney client privilege uh, perspectives. Um, so anyway, but those are great solutions out there. And if you're not using them today, and most of them a couple hundred bucks or something, it's really cheap to to, to run through those uh, solutions and, and highly, highly, highly recommend it because you'd be amazed how much information you can learn from a good custodian questionnaire. So with that, I'll thank the ACEDS community and for everybody else who attended today's webinar. Brian, Barry, great job. You guys sprinted through a marathon's worth of information and did a great job as always. For those questions that we didn't get to answer, and there's quite a few of them, uh, we will do that. We will send everybody on this uh, webinar a link to the BIA blog and also answer some individually uh, where appropriate. Uh, Mary and the team at ACEDS, again, thank you very much. We certainly appreciate these opportunities. Well, thank you, Mark, and thank you, uh, Brian and Barry, for a wonderful, wonderful webinar. Thank you, BIA, for making you all available to us, and thank you, everyone, for listening in on the ACEDS webinar channel. Uh, stay tuned for tomorrow's Ask the Expert. We'll have uh, the ubiquitous Jared and Kaylee.